Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Eld. You're watching The Political Vigilante. We are joined by a former co-host of Boom Bust on RT America, Rachel Blevins. Rachel, thank you for taking time out to come on the show today. And I wanted to talk to you um, cause I've, I mean, Lee, you know, Lee camps, a friend of mine, we do a weekly show. We've talked about it. We had Christy, I on the show last week to discuss it. Um, and I first wanted to get, you know, your take on what you think, ha what, what brought this on? I know like it feels to me, and this is something that Lee talked about that, that this feels like somebody leaned, like the state department leaned on somebody or something like that, because what is so clearly happening since this Russian invasion of Ukraine is there cannot be any alternative narrative than the one that is coming out of the West. And which is so funny because we're accusing Russia. Oh, they're, they're not, you can't call it a war. You can only call it a special assignment or whatever they're calling it, you know? Um, yeah. and yet we, will not show any other narrative with regard to the history of Ukraine with what happened in 2014. So, I mean, you know, you worked there for a while and you went through all of this. What, what do you think like happened or what do you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was there for almost four years and it, I think going through it, it just kind of felt like the rug was pulled out from under us because I know that when Gosh, you look from, you know, towards the end of February when everything broke out in Ukraine, it, a lot of my colleagues and myself, we were getting just these horrible messages all over social media. We were getting death threats. And it was like this onslaught of people that were looking for somewhere to put their anger and they were putting it on RT. And so then all of a sudden, in a matter of days, you had Direct TV, you had Roku pulling RT America, saying that they weren't going to air it anymore. And then YouTube was a little bit after that. But I think when YouTube moved to ban RT International and Sputnik and that sort of thing, we knew that RT America was going to be coming up shortly after that. Now, in terms of what was kind of that final nail in the coffin, I don't know. I could see so, you know, it being the possibility of some sort of U.S. government something. But the interesting thing there is that RT America was already registered as a quote unquote foreign agent. So mm -hmm. the, you know, the government was already they knew exactly what we were doing. They saw every show that we filmed, everything that we put on air, that sort of a thing. And so I think it really took me by surprise because I always just assumed and clearly this was wrong, but I always just thought that. RT America was going to continue to kind of be the mainstream media's whipping boy, where they constantly pointed at it and said, you know, look how terrible RT is. And then at the same time, don't look at what we're doing and all of the things that we're covering up. And now they, they don't have that anymore. Yeah, it is really just, I mean, you know, the, the famous quote, the first casualty of war is the truth. And, and, you know, I've had to dig around to find so many you know, different perspectives that just the, the, the American media won't, won't put out there. I mean, you know, even just, and I'm not in favor of what, of what Putin is doing, but his depiction is just this like crazy tyrant who's just rolling tanks through Europe. Like, you know, Hitler did in the, in the late thirties. I'm like, that's just not accurate. I mean, he, he ha doesn't, you know, there's no mention of, of the Azov brigade, you know, being a, basically neo-Nazis. I mean, there's no, there's no mention. You can't even discuss that here. You can't even talk about how, you know, I, I, I showed on, on, on this show, maybe a month ago, Putin saying, can you imagine if we put Russian bases in Canada or Mexico, the United States would go nuts. And yeah. that's a valid point. And no one, no one is, no one is even mentioning that. Like there's, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, they, they just have, Really, and this happened. I mean, God, I remember. I remember seeing this in you know the Iraq invasion almost twenty years ago. They just clamp it down, and and the U.S. so-called free press just becomes state media itself. Yeah. And and uh, you know, so what? I, I it's just like hard hard to find any like accurate reporting of what is going on at all. I mean, oh, Putin's bombing civilians, but then you, you, you dig around on the internet and you see that maybe there's, 
Ukrainians are using civilians as as as, as human shields and stuff. So I don't know what what are you what are you seeing? What are you? Uh, how are you like yeah. navigating through all this? Yeah, I agree. I think it's incredibly concerning when you look at the fact that they it's not even that they just want everything to be one sided. It's that they're almost encouraging people to be in favor of one side and against the other. So mm -hmm. it puts you in this world where everything Russia does is evil. And then at the same time, you can't even criticize someone like Ukrainian President Zelensky when he's banning 11 political parties, including the largest opposition party in his country. And then he's now nationalizing TV news. And I look at that and I just think these are actions that aren't going to end just when this war ends, you know, and it, it, it has been incredibly frustrating to watch the way in which that is rolled out. And then at the same time, you know, as you mentioned, when we look at what the Russian government is doing, it's clear that they could have gone in on day one overtaken the Ukrainian government, completely just rolled in and attacked the country in far more of a way than they did. Now, what I think when I look at this conflict is that, look, you've got a country like Ukraine where the United States has been the first one to give them billions and billions of dollars of weapons and quote unquote lethal aid as they want to call it. And so you've got a country where there's a lot of chaos and there are these far right neo-Nazi militias, which even though the media wants to act like they don't exist, they are still there. And so Russia's looking at the situation and knowing that if they were to go in and just topple whatever order is there right now, that that would lead to complete chaos, which would go against one of these two main demands that they've had for years and years and years. And so I think when you're looking at this situation, it is frustrating to see how the media is covering it and how they're trying to make it so one-sided. And it also raises the question too, why aren't they the ones who are calling for peace in this? And granted, we probably know why they're not. However, it is a reminder of the fact that, you know, when it comes to attempts at peace talks like the ones that we're seeing right now, we see Russia willing to give some concessions, saying that it will back off in its targeting of Kiev, notably trying to build some trust. And then on the other hand, you have Ukraine, where the U.S. State Department right now is openly saying that they have told Zelensky not to make any concessions whatsoever as they continue to fuel the country with more and more weapons. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, and, and, and you know, uh, um, several weeks before the invasion, Zelensky was saying the West is creating the tension here. I mean, he said that, you know, he said, we're coming in and, and, you know, all this stand with Ukraine stuff is kind of like, do the, do the Ukrainians and do Americans know that we're using them? Like we, like America always does is just like pawns in a proxy war. We don't care. I mean, the United, United States government doesn't care about the Ukrainian people that just pretend it just uses them as convenience. And then, it's to watch this, you know, it's, it's awful. I I'm against war. I I've, I've, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan as a comedian. I've seen war up close as much as you can as a civilian. And, and I've never been in combat, but I've been shot at on a helicopter. I've seen, I've seen awful stuff. I've seen wounded people, wounded kids. So I'm against, I'm against war uh, just across the board. I'm against it. So to hear all this, like Putin's a war criminal. Okay, if we're going to call him a war criminal, then who, who, what, who is Joe Biden, who as vice president watched Obama drop more bombs than Bush? I mean, yeah. like the day of the Russian attack, the first day of the invasion, we bombed Somalia and Syria. Like we, we're, we're just bombing. Like there's 377,000 dead people as a result of the war in Yemen, a war we've backed since 2014. Again, when Obama and his vice president Biden and secretary of state Hillary Clinton were like all gung ho for it. I, I and yeah. I, yeah. You, I, you I, were preaching yeah. to the choir here. Absolutely. And, and then you look at the fact that there is no incentive in place, especially here in the United States for any of those war criminals to do anything different. I mean, I know we just passed the 19th anniversary of the Iraq invasion, and we look back at the fact that all of the architects of the Iraq war, if they're still alive today, are still walking free, and in some cases even being celebrated 
Or, you know, you look at someone like George W. Bush, where now he's been completely rehabilitated and the public is convinced that he's just like your grandfather. He's this harmless painter who enjoys sharing candy with Michelle Obama. And you don't take into account the fact that this man has this horrible history while he was in office and he made foreign policy decisions that have led to millions of people suffering who are still suffering today because as a result of it, you know, and it, it goes into the exact same way when you look at the U.S. involvement in the 2014 coup in Ukraine. All of those people, people like Victoria Nuland, they're still in the U.S. government today. They were not called out. There was no accountability for the role that they played in a government overthrow that has led to continued suffering that has helped fuel the tensions that we see today. Instead, it's just kind of business as usual for them. Yeah, all of them. All of these other war criminals in the United States are they're doing fine. They're working in government, they're on they're doing book tours, like whatever. Right. Like they're they're fine, man. Like it's just like, you know, um they're gonna be and, writing a how-to books before we know it, so that yeah. we <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. can figure uh, out how they made it. I mean, it is just, just, it's ridiculous when you think of, and it is kind of how desensitized the American public has become to all of this. I mean, we don't know what war zones look like. We don't see footage. If you ever notice when television news will show you footage of a bombing or the aftermath of an airstrike, it's always when it's another country. It's never when it's the United States. They're never showing you the result of what your tax dollars are paying for and what this continued foreign policy is creating in countries around the world. And so for the American people, we just kind of shrug it off because it is impossible for us to imagine what that actually would be like if that is your life that you have to see every day. Yeah, it's a, you make a, gr a great point. Like the, And the images they're showing from Ukraine, they understand the emotional uh, power that these images have. So it's like, you see like, oh my God, a grandmother and a children and people crying and people, you know, being separated because the men have to stay and the women are leaving. And you see these images and you're like, wow, it's like, this is awful. And it is awful. But I just, every time I watch this, I go, why are we, we haven't seen like almost no images of, of the hellfire we have brought to Yemen to Syria, to, I mean, 20 years we were in Afghanistan. We spent $3.5 trillion, four presidents from two political parties, wait, just did this for 20 years so that we got, we replaced the Taliban with the more heavily armed Taliban. Like yeah. uh, it was, it was like, it's insane. To well, watch. Especially when you look at the fact that now they keep talking about sending more and more weapons and, you know, they refer to it as lethal aid, I guess, is the new term now from the U.S. to Ukraine. And then the question becomes, well, what's going to happen with all of that? Because when the U.S. historically just sends off weapons to other countries, they have no accountability, no oversight for where those weapons go. They just can't. And they act as if they're helping the people. And it's like, this is not going to help the Ukrainian people. This is not going to bring peace to their country. And yet you look at the media's coverage of it. And I know I think it was The Guardian this week that had this headline in which they were saying that, oh, the Russian military only has three days worth of supplies left. And it's like, that's the narrative that you're selling to people is that if we just send them more weapons, then they are going to defeat Russia. And from everything we've seen, that is certainly not the case, at least right now. No, not at all. Well, I want to ask you as you as you've been watching this unfold, like as this uh, this is this unfolds, you know, in the middle of you like losing your job and all of this, how, how do you how do you see all this? How do you, how do you see this play out? You know, with like cuz to me it feels like the only reasonable thing is like if Zelensky just finally goes, "Look, I'm done with the West and NATO. I don't want to I don't want them." Putin, you know, give me some concessions, start, pull out start, and, 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 you know, we can have the Donbass region and just leave us alone and help us rebuild. And like, I could see Zelensky and Putin potentially coming to that, but I don't see the West is like, literally going to shove Zelensky into Putin, like schoolyard bullies wanting to see kids fight. I mean, like, I, I, it's just like, you yeah. know, how, how do you yeah. see this playing out? You know, that that's a tough one. I think that given everything that's happened over the last month, I mean, that's a possibility. Now, the interesting thing here with someone like Zelensky is that 
he clearly knows that he has Washington's attention, basically, that they're backing him up. And we've seen that with all of the ridiculous speeches that he's given to a number of countries where, you know, like here in the U.S., he's talking about Mount Rushmore and MLK Jr. and 9-11 and all this stuff, trying to gain more and more support. But then at the same time, Zelensky knows and NATO has told him that they are not going to add Ukraine as a member. So, I I don't really get this dream that he seems to have that eventually NATO is just going to say, okay, okay, all right, bad. Let's add you to our alliance. And now we're going to go directly to World War III with Russia. Now, there could be a scenario where Zelensky finally says, okay, fine, I'll give in. Let's try to work with Russia. And then that probably to a certain extent, I don't know how much longer he would stay in power just, you know, from his own career and everything that he's been through. I'm also curious to see kind of how the breakup of Ukraine is going to look like, if that's going to be a possibility, because I know that when it comes to sort of the eastern half of Ukraine, you have a lot more people that are ethnically Russian. You have a lot more people that want peace with Russia because, of course, they're in that region. These are their brothers and sisters when you're looking back historically. And so I, I could see it going the way of Zelensky finally saying, OK, I'm not doing this anymore. But I could also see it going the way of the people of Ukraine and more and more of them saying, OK, we are going to have some sort of a breakup moving forward. And then you lead to sort of a west half of Ukraine that continues in the way that it wants to be, where it wants to pursue, pursue a partnership with the European Union. Now, of course, in the same way that we saw the media coverage of Crimea back in 2014, where 97% of the people there voted to join Russia. And then the media spun it and said, oh, well, Russia invaded Crimea. And they said that they weren't going to do that. Like, of course, if that is what ends up happening, you know that the media spin on that is going to make it as if they're really going to continue this whole Putin is evil narrative instead of looking at the actual breakdown of this country, because I think that's one of the most frustrating things when you see the media coverage is that they act as if geography does not exist and they act as if there is no history between Russia and Ukraine and that Ukraine is just this little island out in the middle of nowhere that Russia decided it was going to discover and take on and it just... It's yeah. never ending. Was, yeah, I know it's funny. They act, they act like this is a completely autonomous country. Like they, most Ukrainians have family in Russia and vice versa. Like everybody, like it's 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 a, a sister culture, a sister country. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy to watch. Um, I I want to ask you this as well. Um, so obviously America has been sanctioning you know Russia pretty heavily on this. When the sanctions first hit, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 billion rubles that went into Bitcoin. Um, we've seen uh, tens of millions of dollars go to Ukraine in aid in crypto. Um, and, you know, Putin has said, I think last week, he said that anyone wants to do business with us, they have to pay in rubles, you know, and he's got some leverage because even Western European countries are buying oil from him and natural gas. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering. At some point, does Putin just say Russia is moving to Bitcoin like the way El Salvador did? I mean, I, I, it seems like the, if you, you know, you, if you read the white paper, the Satoshi white paper, like this is what it was Bitcoin specifically, not the altcoins, but Bitcoin specifically was designed to do this. And Joe Biden himself last year said Bitcoin's bad because it limits America's ability to sanction people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes, that that what makes, that's what makes it bad. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, wh what, how do you, do, I mean, do you see, uh, Russia adopting Bitcoin across the board or, uh, I mean, how do you see the economic side of this play out? You know, that's an interesting question because it was just a few months ago that the Russian government was actually looking at an all out ban on cryptocurrency. And that's something that not necessarily Putin was considering, but I know the Russian central bank that they were heavily considering. And then you had everything break out in Canada with the truckers where the Canadian government came in and they said that they were going to start targeting and freezing people's bank accounts. And then you had everything with Russia and all of the sanctions related to that. So it's been interesting to 
kind of watch that turn around with the Russian government now saying, well, wait a second, maybe we don't want to go this route. Now, in terms of them actually moving forward to make Bitcoin legal tender, I don't know if I see that just yet, but I am curious to see how it plays out with, you know, some of the statements that we've heard from the government. It's been really interesting to watch and see over the last week or so, they've talked about it and they've said, well, you know, for those quote unquote friendly, because they're kind of dividing countries up into friendly and unfriendly right now. And they're saying for the friendly countries, you can trade with us in whatever you want. If it's your national currency, we'll even consider Bitcoin, that sort of thing. And so I think with that rhetoric, that of course may be something that they would consider. Now, the question then becomes what that is going to look like when Russia does continue to move forward with this digital ruble, because right now, now, digital currencies, central bank backed digital currencies, rather, are all the rage. And of course, those central banks don't love cryptocurrencies because that's the decentralized version of what they're trying to roll out and what they're trying to get everyone to adopt. So as soon as they do get that Russian or that digital ruble on track, then it'll be interesting to see kind of how crypto friendly they are. But as for right now, when they're watching countries like the U.S. and countries across the EU announcing unprecedented sanctions, it does not surprise me at all that they're sitting there saying, well, hey, why? Why not give crypto a try? This is something we'd consider. Yeah, it, it'll be. I'm curious to see how this plays out because I want. I, I think there's there's also another to to talk about the American side here. So um, the American, you know, Biden and the government and the Western media is like, oh, Putin's all isolated, and it's like, well, really? He's got China and India on his side, which are two, the two biggest countries in the world population wise. Uh, one of the like maybe the biggest economy in China. Um, I, I'm wondering, has Biden in America, has Biden like basically painted America into a corner here where financially, where, because at some point, even Western Europe might go, because I, I remember I, I covered this on my show a couple of months ago before the, the invasion of, you know, Biden was saying, well, we don't want Germany to have that, Russian pipeline. We want Germany to buy our oil, which is more expensive, our natural gas, which is more expensive. So at some point, does even Western Europe go, well, we'd, we're better off doing business with Russia and the way China, it's Silk Road initiative. I mean, you know, China just builds metro, you know, stop yeah. you know, train stations and stadiums. I mean, they're just building all this stuff. America goes in and sanctions and bombs the shit out of everybody. And at some point <laughs> people yeah. are going to go, uh, I think we'll go with them, you know, so, yeah, so and like is I was going to say that's exactly what we're seeing right now with I think one of the most interesting examples of this has been really Southeast Asia because the Biden administration came out at the beginning of this year and they released some 19 page document where basically they said that they were going to work on their ties with countries in Southeast Asia. And their way of doing that was to say, we want to so that they get closer to the US than they are to China. So it's been like literally less than a month since that document was released. They were supposed to have this big summit with the Association for Southeast Asian Nations. And instead, yesterday, Biden had a bilateral summit with Singapore. And the reason that he only met with Singapore was because that's the only country in Southeast Asia that basically followed Washington's demands on condemning Russia and imposing sanctions against Russia. So the other nine countries in that alliance have all kind of taken a step back here. They've wanted to appear more neutral. And part of the reason is because they have strong economic ties to Russia and at the same time to China. So they're looking at this situation and they're realizing, well, if we condemn Russia, if we sanction Russia, that hurts our economies. But it doesn't really give us any benefit other than that they get to go to some summit here in Washington, D.C. and Biden, you know, they, they get to have a press con conference with him, basically. So I agree that it's like the U.S. has had years and years of being able to essentially boss everyone around to bomb whatever country they want. And they continue to act like that. But the problem is that now by going after a country like Russia, that is known for its natural resources that supplies so much all around the world. Now what they're doing is they're harming the economies of the countries that 
would just follow the United States lead for the sake of following its lead. And when it comes to, you know, what we've seen in the European Union, Germany has been very vocal about the fact that if they do what the U.S. wants and tomorrow they cut off all energy imports from Russia, their economies would crash completely because they rely on Russia for around 40 percent of their natural gas supplies. So even though they've kind of backed off the Nord Stream 2 pipeline for now and they're taking a step back and basically saying, OK, we won't certify it now. At the same time, they're not nearly as quick to say, yeah, let's just cut off all of our supplies because the U.S. does not have a good answer for what it would look like if countries across Europe don't rely on Russia. You know, the U.S. will say, oh, we'll give you supplies or you can get supplies from Dubai. But none of those answers are going to lessen energy prices at all, given the fact that right now they're already skyrocketing. And so you're right. It really does paint the U.S. into a corner. And yet they're doing all of this to themselves. Yeah, they're doing this. And, and I'm just wondering here with, I mean, you know, the, the housing crisis of, of 2008, you know, there was no real, there was Dodd-Frank, which is like a Band-Aid on a shotgun wound. There was no real regulation. <laughs> so it can, it can happen again. I mean, like we're already seeing all of these bubbles that were created before COVID that are now starting that, that are not, but even looking potentially worse, we've mm -hmm. done the printing of all these stimulus plans. We've printed trillions of dollars, um, which I, I understand some of it needed to get to help some people out, but most of it went to wall street and, uh, you know, we're seeing the inflation already that they're, they're saying, Oh, it's 10% inflation. Well, I, I don't think anyone who made that report has gone to a grocery store, uh, yeah. it's like 20 to 30% inflation. I don't know. I, don't, I literally don't know what they're, how, how they're coming up with this math, but on top of all the things you just talked about, isn't also America just on the brink of like a bad financial collapse, like, to, like run on the banks type of chaos. I mean, in a housing collapse, isn't, aren't we like on the brink of that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's crazy when you think back to 2020 when there were recession warnings then and then the Federal Reserve came in and they said, you know what, we're just going to print trillions upon trillions of dollars and we're going to prop up our economy during historic lockdowns. And then they continued those policies for the next two years. And so now that puts us in a situation where, you know, the Fed has sat there and not only not only have they lied about what the actual inflation numbers are, but they've used words like transitory to swear that those numbers won't be that high for too long. And then they had to come back around at the end of last year and kind of say, OK, OK, maybe we weren't as right about that. But even now they're saying that those inflation numbers are supposed to be cut in half by the end of this year. And yet we're in a situation where we're looking at how many supply chain shortages we've already seen. And now we're looking at even more as the U.S. sanctions Russia and hits on things like fertilizer and wheat supplies and those little things that may or I guess they may seem little, but still have a massive impact on the overall supply chain. And so, yeah, now we're in a position where the Federal Reserve is kind of saying, OK, like we'll, we'll raise interest rates, we'll reduce our balance sheet, we'll back off of asset purchases, all of the good things that you want to hear. But then the question becomes, one, how long? are they going to let that happen if there is some sort of a crash in the stock market? Are they going to go right back to propping everything back up? And then, of course, what is the result of that? Because we've been on the heels of the government kind of propping things up, propping things up over and over again. And it just creates this really this house of cards where we're now in the position of wondering how much longer we're going to be able to stand this, especially as the U.S. tries to really sanction the whole world, but mainly Russia and China. <laughs> we are trying to sanction the whole world. I mean, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I've just seen so much, so much crazy stuff happen just in the last month of like, you know, America put prop, like even in Venezuela, right? Another oil country. Um, we said, oh, Juan Guaido is the new president. And was like, what? Who's this guy? Yeah. And then last, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Biden was like, oh, I need to talk to the president Maduro about getting some oil reserves. And it's like, oh, now, now Maduro's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that works. Yeah. And you know, what's funny too, and this did not get a lot of media coverage at all, but 
when the U.S. decided that it was going to go after Venezuela and it was going to cut them off and force their people to accept Juan Guaido. Well, in 2020, the U.S. saw a record number of oil imports from Russia. And so now it's as if they flip flopped it and they've said, OK, wait a second. Now Russia is the bad guy of the year. We don't want their supplies. Now we're going to go to Venezuela. And it, it, and yet those policies are still in place. Those sanctions are still in place. So they're going to Venezuela and they're saying, hey, we need your supplies and uh, we'll work things out later, so to speak. And I, you know, it makes me wonder where Juan Guaido is at. I don't he's not doing too well with ruling that country. Yeah, I guess the puppet, the puppet president just think his phone was broken. That's why they called yeah. Maduro or something like that. It's just like, so it's probably just, a, it's probably just a clerical error. That's all it was. No, not the CIA's um, best work. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, like, I mean, if America just, I, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't, I, I don't want to be like too like a pop apocalyptic, apocalyptic, but. I just see America just painting itself into more and more problems financially and like doing acting the way empires act, which is spreading itself too thin militarily, getting itself tangled up in all this stuff. I mean, we've been pushing this. I mean, there's, there's, there's interviews from 2014 and 2015 of like, you know, Eastern European scholars saying we're pushing, we're pushing Russia into this war. I mean, like we we've been trying to do this for a while. I mean, is, is this the beginning of the end of the United States? I mean, like, are we, I, I wonder, like, is the United States in its current form going to be around in five to 10 years? Or is like, is California going to break off? Is Texas going to, I mean, are we just going to get balkanized? Like, I don't know. Oh, oh, I, Texas I don't get... is going to be out of here before anybody else. Uh, California is <laughs> going to be jealous. I'm sure Texas has had their, uh, their, their independence party, quote unquote, ready for this for years now. So they're ready. Um, but no, I think, I don't know that it'll be a five to 10 year kind of thing, but I do think that what we're seeing right now is this really powerful shift where for so long, the U S has called the shots for so long, the dollar has been the world's reserve currency and they have abused that left and right. And so you've got countries like China, like India, like Russia that have been working to rely less and less on the U S dollar for years. Now, this is something that they've already been in the process of doing. And what they're realizing is that they can kind of look to each other and say, okay, well, you also have been under heavy threats for the United States. So why don't you and I work together? And it, and all of a sudden what that does is that takes the U S as really the bully that it has become and it lessens its power around the world. And it's also been notable to see in the middle East where now leaders there are getting together and working together amongst themselves because they're realizing that all of a sudden the U.S. is not paying as much attention to their region anymore after 20 years and however many trillions of dollars it poured into the region. And now those Middle East leaders are actually complaining and they're complaining about the double standard that they see, which is that the United States is calling on the entire world saying the whole world needs to suffer and they need to suffer for the quote unquote Ukrainian people. And you've got people across the Middle East that are saying, well, wait a second, our people have been suffering for you know two decades now and no one did anything about that. You know, the United States didn't care when it was our civilians. And now all of a sudden they think that they are caring about, they say that they care about Ukraine. I mean, the U.S. is kind of, it's, it's showing its true colors. So I don't know if it'll be the next decade or two, but I think that if the U.S. continues with the path that it's on right now, the results are not going to be good down the road. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, it's it's not a question of if it's just a when. That's the only to me. It just seems like it's a when and what it'll look like. But like it's it's coming no matter what. Um, well, Rachel, we really appreciate you taking time out um, to join us today. I know it's been a crazy couple of weeks for you. Um, where where you know anything in the works or where can people are you going to be doing other stuff or where you have a YouTube show or anything like that that people can come follow. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually on Rockfin. I'm still trying to get my Rockfin channel up off the ground. I do weekly live streams every Tuesday and still working on that. So they're welcome to follow me there. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, you name it. You name it. I am wherever they will have me. 
essentially, even if I'm labeled as Russian state media, like I am on Twitter, but I'm still there and still uh, tweeting away. So thank you so much for having me on the show. I appreciate yes. it. And folks, it's another reason to go to rockman.com and join because there's all like uh, lead camps on there. I mean, Abby Martin, it's just, it's, there's, a, there's amazing people on there and they don't censor anybody. It's blockchain. They pay us in cryptocurrency. It's, it's really the future and they don't, they, there's no censorship at all. So it's another reason to go to Rockman. So, um, well, Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely have you back. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a great day. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. We are still in our like ninth month of demonetization from YouTube. So support what we're doing at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. It's free to sign up and there's a premium level at $10 a month. And for that, you get everybody on the platform's premium content. Myself, Lee Camp, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Whitney Webb, Kim Iverson, Abby Martin, and many, many others. You can also support what we're doing at Venmo at Graham-Elwood and go to GrahamElwood.com. We have a PayPal button and a PO box. I also have crypto wallets, which are all in the show notes. Thanks for supporting what we do.